How's it going everyone? Today we're going to go over a very high yield practice question covering the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So pause this video and try it on your own and we'll jump through it. So this question is really combining a couple of different elements. One is the fetal circulation. We're testing the umbilical vein here. And what's the umbilical vein? Well, in the fetal circulation, in the umbilical cord, the umbilical cord has three components. It has two umbilical arteries, which are going away from the fetus back to mom, carrying that less oxygenated blood after the fetus has used it. And then one umbilical vein, which is actually more oxygenated because it's going to the fetus and providing some extra oxygen for that fetus to use. Now, one of the adaptations that evolution has created is fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin actually has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin A. And this question tests that concept. So let's jump into that concept here. So which of the following characteristics of hemoglobin F best explains the higher oxygen saturation observed in fetal blood? So this might seem like we're testing this niche concept of fetal hemoglobin and its affinity to 2,3 BPG, which is a little bit of a slightly lower yield topic for the MCAT. But really what this question is getting after is how well do you understand the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve? So let's draw that quickly. So here's our oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And this curve is going to be what we call sigmoidal. I like to think about it more as S-shaped. If you think about this curve, it's sort of an S, although not a very curved one, albeit. On the x-axis, we're going to have our oxygen tension, or how much oxygen we have. And then on the y-axis, we're going to have our percent saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen as we increase the partial pressure of oxygen, which is basically the concentration of oxygen that we have in dissolved in a liquid, in this case being the blood, we're going to increase the amount of hemoglobin that's going to be saturated with oxygen, eventually getting near 100% saturation. Okay, so that's what we've got going on there. Now we need to know the four basic factors that are going to cause what we call a rightward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And a rightward shift means that at the same concentration or partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, we have a reduction in the amount of hemoglobin that's carrying oxygen. For example, if we were to measure this at, let's say, 80 millimeters of mercury of oxygen here, let's say this would be 90% versus this rightward shift would be 80% of the hemoglobin would be occupied by oxygen. Now, the four things that are going to cause a rightward shift, we definitely want to know for test A. The first of those is going to be an increase in temperature. Now, I like to think about a lot of these in the context specifically of exercise. When we exercise, we tend to heat up our body a little bit more. So increased temperature is going to cause that rightward shift. Okay. Second is going to be a decreased pH. When we exercise, we tend to be a little bit oxygen starved and create more lactate. Part of the reason we do that is that oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. As such, we're not able to run oxidative phosphorylation as much, and instead we're running anaerobic glycolysis more than shunting pyruvate to lactate. So we're gonna get a reduction in pH, and that will be another trigger for a rightward shift. The next one would be an increase in CO2. This sort of goes along with a reduction in pH as we're exercising or any other physiologic stress, we are having a reduction in the amount of CO2 that we're able to blow off as well as an increase in the production of CO2 as we're running the Krebs cycle more and more. Remember, some of those byproducts of the Krebs cycle are gonna be molecules of CO2. And then finally, we have this funny molecule, which is a byproduct of a side pathway of glycolysis called 2,3-BPG. It sounds a lot like 1,3-BPG or 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, a substrate that we see in glycolysis. Now in conditions where the oxygen tension or the oxygen concentration of the air is low, for example in high altitude, our body will actually take an energetic hit and produce less ATP, in fact to make this molecule, 2,3-BPG, specifically to cause a rightward shift of this curve right here. Think about it, if we were on top of Mount Everest, this partial pressure of oxygen would be lower due to an increased altitude, 
our body might start making more 2,3 BBG to cause a rightward shift of that axis. So that's the prerequisite knowledge that we need to have there. Okay, so we know that 2,3 BPG causes a rightward shift. Then it would make sense that less 2,3 BPG would cause a leftward shift, which is what this question is getting after. What's going to be causing a leftward shift? Less 2,3 BPG actually binding to that hemoglobin. So let's go through the answers. Fetal hemoglobin has a low affinity for 2,3 BPG resulting in a leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin association curve. So if we have a low amount of 2,3-BBG binding to hemoglobin, that would make sense that we get a leftward shift because we know that more would move it right. So that seems like a pretty good answer and is our correct answer. These other answers don't make sense. And we don't even really need to know why fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity or a lower affinity for 2,3-BBG rather biochemically, we just need to have a little bit of knowledge about the oxyhemoglobin association curve. So we can see that B is wrong. Fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for 2,3-BPG. Even without reading the question, we know this is wrong because if more 2,3-BPG was binding, this would result in a rightward shift. So B can't be correct. C, fetal hemoglobin has a lower affinity for 2,3-BPG resulting in a rightward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Again, this can't be correct because we have, if we have decreased 2,3 BPG, something that causes a rightward shift, that means it should be shifting at left, and that's not the case in C, so we can eliminate C as well. And then finally, D. Fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for 2,3 BPG, resulting in a rightward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. If you looked at this on its own, that is a factually correct statement. However, the question is telling us that the oxygen saturation in the umbilical vein is actually higher than in an adult artery. And for the oxygen saturation to be higher, we actually have to have a leftward shift to have an increase in the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin at that same concentration of oxygen dissolved in the blood.